All right. Good evening and welcome everyone. Thank you for spending your dinner hour with us. My name is Laura Edmonston and I am a deputy law librarian for the Washington State Law Library. And I'm also the current chair of the Washington Library Association's Special Library Division. This year, we have introduced you to the world of law libraries, the world of tribal libraries, and this evening, WLA SLD is once again thrilled to team up with President Laura Grove and our colleagues at the Pacific Northwest chapter of the Special Library Association, Libraries Association to bring you our third and final virtual Special Libraries Crawl of 2021. We are extremely excited this evening to be joined by representatives of the Getty Research Institute Library and the library at the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art, who will be introducing us to the world of art libraries and answering your questions. And I wanna go through just a couple of housekeeping items before we get started. We are recording today's event and we'll be posting this recording on the WLA YouTube channel where you can also find recordings of our other two library crawls. And then following today's tours, we also invite you to stick around for the social portion of the, the library crawl, the crawl of the library crawl, if you will, which is a time for you to join your um, colleagues in a Zoom breakout room and, and get to know each other from around the region. So at this time, SLA PNW President Laura Grove and I would like to take just a couple of minutes to tell you a little bit more about our organizations and some of the many benefits of membership if you are not already a member. The mission of the WLA Special Libraries Division is to unite and strengthen membership by promoting continuous learning partnerships and sharing common skills and expertise utilized in special, specialized library and information settings. Along with events like this library crawl, we offer presentations and workshops at the annual WLA conference. This year, we've got two workshops scheduled. Um, you can participate in career development programming, such as the WLA Career Lab, which we did this past year, and we're working on a, developing additional activities. You can add the Special Libraries Division to your existing WLA membership for just $10. If you're not already a member of WLA, you can add SLD when you register for no additional charge. Individual WLA membership is based on salary and you can find the full price range scale on the WLA website. WLA also offers organizational memberships, which include memberships for up to eight people in your library. There are a number of great benefits, including discounted conference registration fees, great programming, um, and video conferencing, access to Alki Magazine, job announcements, and so much more. Plus, you have access to several great divisions, such as our very own Special Libraries Division. So I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Laura Grove, and she's going to tell you about SLA p &W. Thank you, Laura E. Membership in SLA provides networking opportunities with other special librarians, education through an annual conference and other events, leadership development, and industry information such as a salary survey and a career center. Membership in the Pacific Northwest community can be added at no additional charge to an SLA membership. The current publication is Information Insights, a weekly curated e-newsletter to keep members apprised of recent developments in the field. Membership rates are posted on the website, including a student rate. This year, we particularly appreciate our collaboration with WLA SLD on events. For SLA members, please vote on the candidates for the SLA Board of Directors. You should have received an email with your unique voting link or refer to the email from President Tara Murray Grove. Thank you for your participation in SLA. And I will now turn it back to Laura E. All right, thank you, Laura G. And now it is time for the main event this evening. I am going to turn it over to WLA SLD Secretary Judy Pitchford of the Washington State Library, who is going to introduce you to our first presenter. As we mentioned, we are going to have a question and answer period, but there is the chat box. So if you think of a question during their presentations, 
go ahead and drop it in the chat. And um, Sarah is going to be monitoring that and she'll make sure that it gets brought up during the Q&A. So you're welcome to ask those questions live or drop them in the chat during the presentations. So Judy, please um, let us know about our first presenter. Thanks, Laura. Our first presenter is Annalise Welty. She's a reference librarian at the Getty Research Institute. She recently co-authored the chapter, Reconsidering the Reference Collection, Using Print Art Reference Materials as Training Tools in the New Art Museum Library. Uh, previously, she was Senior Library Associate at the Thomas J. Watson Library in the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Annalise is an active member of um, the Art Library Society of North America and ser serving as the 2019 to 2021 co-moderator for the Intersectional Feminism and Art Special Interest Group and the 2021 Vice Chair, Chair-Elect for the Arliss SoCal Chapter. She received a BA in Classics from Trinity College, Connecticut, an MA in the History of Art and Design, and an MS in Information and Library Science from Pratt Institute. Thanks for joining us, Annalise. everybody i hope can you hear me yes okay great thank <laughs> just always good to double check um i'm so excited to be here with everyone tonight um and so grateful to be included to speak about my work at the getty research institute um i just wanted to say quickly how cool it is for me personally to be involved um with libraries from washington and the pacific northwest i'm from maine originally so it's been quite a journey coming out to Los Angeles and um, being out here and working with all these amazing organizations. Um, so I feel like even though we're remote, I still feel like I'm getting to travel a lot uh, in this context. So welcome to the Getty Research Institute. I hope that everyone will be able to come visit if you haven't already uh, in the future when we fully reopen, we're still doing a phased reopening very slowly. That's changing all the time, as I'm sure you can all relate to the up and down struggle of whatever it is that's happening now. So um, I've included some slides here that I usually include for visiting groups, um, just to give you a sense of the physical space, even though you know we're not necessarily gonna be able to can bring you by the reference desk and the circulation desk and show you some collection materials. So I'm gonna do my best to have that happen in this remote environment. So I wanted to see. Did that slide advance? No, okay. It wouldn't be a presentation on Zoom without technical difficulties. I was saying this before, no matter what happens. So I. I believe my PowerPoint is frozen. Okay, did we go? Okay, yay, excellent. So I wanted to put my, uh, my name and contact here. If you have any follow-up questions in the future or wanna know more about using the library, please do not hesitate to reach out and contact me. I'm more than happy to chat or help direct you to some of our resources um, as you're interested in. So before I really dive into the Getty, I just wanted to say a few more words about my own path. Um, and how I got here all the way from Maine. Um, I studied, I was a classics major um, and I, I didn't really know what I wanted to do with that. I studied ancient Greek and Latin and I loved books, of course. And I studied abroad in Rome in college and had a very unique opportunity to intern at La Biblioteca Angelica right off Piazza Navona and an amazing collection of early printed books um, and manuscripts. And it sort of just came out of nowhere. And I thought, how do I do this forever? I want this to be my job um, someday. So I um, went right to grad school after I graduated and I got a dual degree as mentioned at Pratt Institute for Art History and Library Science. Um, and then I worked at the Watson Library at the Met for a few years, which was a fantastic experience. And really kind of solidified my interest in working in public services specifically in reference. Um, and then, you know, speaking of, of locations and traveling, um, someone mentioned before how fun it is and, and interesting it is because there are art libraries everywhere and there are jobs everywhere. So 
when it was time to move on from my role at the Met, I applied to jobs all over from Arkansas, California, places I'd never been before, never didn't know anyone there. Uh, because That okay? Can you hear me again? That was my fault. I apologize. Oh, okay, no problem. <laughs> Screen moved, jumped when I was trying to admit something. No problem. <laughs> um, so, so just kind of the the really global nature um, of of librarianship, um, not just art libraries, but all libraries. So, um, okay, let's jump in, and hopefully this will my slide will advance. Okay, so we're in the Getty Research Institute. On the left here, I wanted to include this picture so you get a sense of the building shape. Um, I always say when I give tours that I'm just relieved that it's not a full circle because people would just be walking and walking and walking and walking and never really realize when they've uh, passed the point of where they began. So um, it's a really cool, open, interactive space. On the right here, I wanted to give an example. There are stacks throughout the building um, that are open stacks available to different levels of readership and staff. So staff desk spaces are, might be cubicles right next to some of the library collections. So it's really unique space. Um, this this carol, desk carol here is used by one of our um, grant recipients, and I'll mention a little bit about that program later. Um, so it's, I really encourage you to come visit if you haven't and get a tour in person someday. So the Getty Research Institute was formed when the J. Paul Getty Trust was established in the early 1980s. Um, so coming from the Met, which was founded in the 1800s, it is definitely a much younger institution. Um, and at that time, the mandate was to build a major cultural institution that included both a museum and a research library. So that was always part of the intention among the other programs. There we go. So the Getty Library initially began as a curatorial library in the Getty Museum that was built off of um, buying scholars' personal library collections. So that's kind of how the foundation began. But I wanted to um, emphasize here with the Getty logo that the collections aren't limited to art materials. So we support the research of, of the Conservation uh, Institute, the Research Institute, the Foundation, and the Museum. So we do have quite a large amount of materials focused on art and art history, um, but we also have materials and scientific techniques relating to um, painting, anything you can think of. Uh, the Conservation Institute works with building structures globally, um, all sorts of building materials and building sites. So it is a very, very wide ranging collection. Archaeology, world cultures, general uh, areas of humanities and social sciences are all included. The Conservation Institute does have um, a small umbrella library um, staffed by librarians um, that are, are more focused on the scientific research aspects, but all of our collections can be searched um, on the library catalog. It's just the one that includes everything there. So the library has been open to the public since 1997, and I have some statistics for you. Um, and this is all pre-COVID statistics, of course. So um, since we've opened to the public, we've had approximately 18,000 registered readers from 70 countries. Um, we offer several levels of uh, readership depending on what kind of resources are required for our research. So um, we serve Getty staff, residential scholars um, that come, and I'll talk a little bit about that later on as well, project researchers, Getty docents and volunteers, um, and then the three levels of readership that we have. So reference desk, again, I know you're, we're all not in person necessarily, but um, just to give you um, some sense, if we were in the physical space, we would now be hitting the reference desk. Um, so, and you see here, this is the slide that I, I will give to our research, new researchers and an orientation to show some of the services we were providing during the closure and now during our phased reopening, one on one appointments with reference librarians. Um, we get the highest volume of our reference requests 
um, by email and um, we reference team will cover rights and reproductions requests for images from our special collections. That's a really big part of our jobs um, for publications and other exhibition materials um, and just general research questions from, you know, I found this painting in my grandmother's attic to um, more, more scholarly endeavors as well. Okay, now we're at the circulation desk. Um, about 80% of the library collections are actually located offsite in a storage facility. So that was really eye-opening to me when I first started working because so many of the collections are on site throughout the building. So to give you kind of a bigger sense of just how many materials we actually have. Um, so those materials are requested in advance. Um, and now we will venture to interlibrary loan desk just down the hallway. And, and again, you can probably see on the left, the curve of the building um, as it wraps around. So you can imagine that as we go. In the upper level, you can see the, the person on the stairs. That is um, That leads to our exhibition space. So our uh, special collections, we have exhibitions regularly that are only Getty Research Institute materials. So there's the museum, which has its own art object collection and exhibitions, and then the Research Institute. And we pull from our study collection. So something that you see hanging on the wall at an exhibition, you can request when it's down and go into the special collections reading room and hold it and use it yourself for your own research. So interlibrary loan, just to know that if there's something in our collections that your library needs, we do participate in interlibrary loan. And now to talk a little bit more about the library collections. So for many years, the focus was primarily on the history of Western European art from antiquity to the present, as is common with many um, art libraries. But in the past decade, we've had a real push to become a more global library and to represent more non-European art historical traditions. So we've been expanding the scope with Latin America, Eastern Europe, Asia. Um, something that I'm really excited to talk about is the African-American Art History Initiative, which is a mouthful, um, better known as AHI, believe it or not, um, which documents and preserves important records, builds the GRI collection of relevant archives and published materials, in addition to supporting scholars, generating new research, um, and disseminating the results through new digitization projects, exhibitions, publications, and public programs. So that um, is an initiative that I've been able to partner with um, as a reference librarian working with their bibliographer um, we presented to some visiting groups. We've worked with our exhibitions department to create research guides and supporting library materials. Um, so if that's of interest in any way to any of you or your users, um, just to know that that exists. Okay, so here on um, the left, I have a screen grab from the Getty Provenance Index and on the right showing boxes from our photo archive. So these collections are, um, we're, we have a lot of materials to support provenance research. So tracing the history and ownership of art objects from one owner to another and tracing them. Um, so the provenance index is freely available online. It has access to some digitized materials and some mostly non-digitized materials, but we are providing scans at this time. And on the right, this photo archive collection is one of my favorites at the library. We have over 2 million study photographs from antiquity to modern up to about 1945. These boxes are come from all over, from collections that were given to us, um, from galleries that have closed internationally, many, many different resources. And this is an open browsing collection, so you can go you can walk amongst the boxes, pull one down, and just leaf through it. You don't need gloves. You don't need an appointment. Um, it is really just spectacular. Um, I've had reference questions about an obscure Dutch artist that I had never heard of before, and we had nothing in the catalog. We had nothing in the provenance index, but we had a box of photographs of works of art and the collections that they were in in our photo archive. So it's, it's just like a, a fun treasure hunt. 
Uh, you can browse um, the boxes and some of the collections online in a database. But this is um, one of the other main, main parts, main roles of my position is to help connect researchers to all of these little various pockets of where our collections live, because there are so many different ways to access the material and so many different types of collections. Okay, special collections. Um, this slide, I wanted to show um, specifically two ways that you can access some of our special collections materials remotely, which has been more important than ever, as we all know. So um, on the left here, we have this book that's been digitized and is made available through the Internet Archive. Um, so you, you might be able to see that the mountain on the top doesn't quite line up. Um, sometimes there are some, some scanning issues, but I use this as an example just to show um, that they are available. It's not, it's not the same thing as in person, but it, it is better than nothing. So um, you can access some links through our library catalog, or if you search the Internet Archive directly, you will be um, shown materials from our collections. And on the right here, I want to highlight our Julia Shulman photograph collection. Um, Julia Shulman was a famous photographer for documenting Southern California architecture. So this is definitely a big area that we get a lot of research questions about. Um, this collection has been almost fully digitized and the Getty owns it. And therefore we make it available for free for any use. You can use it in a publication, you can download it and really do whatever you want with it, um, more or less. And um, this one in particular, I want to highlight because it's a picture of Paul R. Williams, another um, architect that did design in Southern California. And we, um, in the past two years, um, acquired all of his papers in his collection. So we'll be making those available to the public as well. Hope I'm doing okay on time. I We'll wrap up. Okay, just let me know if I'm going over. Getting to the end. Uh, here's our special collections reading room. So if you are interested in viewing some of these materials in person, this is what the space looks like outside of a pandemic um, when we didn't have any spacing or anything like our masks or anything. Um, but you can see it's not a huge room. So space is something that we're always kind of juggling with because we do have a really high demand for these materials. Um, but this gives you a little bit of a sense of how that looks. And I have some more statistics for you. So in our special collections, we have over 72,000 rare books and serials, over 39,000 linear feet of archives, manuscripts, photographs, architectural models, optical devices, nearly 25,000 single prints and drawings and albums, and over 1,000 collections of rare photographs. So in hearing that, you know, we often are asked, what are the, what's the difference between those, you know, a few photographs, but the Getty has a, a museum photographs department. And again, just to explain that our collection is really a study collection first and foremost, where they're preserving their art collection as an object collection that's for exhibition and display um, rather than open to researchers necessarily. Um, I love saying that too about the optical devices. That is another fun thing. Again, you know, no matter what kind of library you're working in, you may have a researcher that um, would find some relevant materials in the Getty collections. Just one more slide. Um, two more resources that you can access remotely on the left, the Getty Open Content Program. So this is a searchable database that highlights images of digitized materials that have been cleared for copyright. So again, if you're looking for helping students find images for um, publication or that don't have any copyright restrictions, that's a helpful resource. Or if you just wanna browse our collections and can't make it in person yet. And then on the right, the Getty Research Portal, this is a project that is hosted by the Getty, but it's not just Getty materials. So we've partnered with, I think about 40 other institutions uh, worldwide. So libraries all across the world have contributed fully digitized art history materials. Um, this example is one of my absolute favorites. It is from the Getty collections. Um, this beautiful book with illustrations of sea creatures and accompanying haiku. 
So again, if you're interested in seeing that or more of those um, sea creatures, you can access this for free online and flip through it through the Getty Research Portal. I also use this image when I am teaching classes, um, especially with younger students or undergraduate interns. Um, and I will include, which I unfortunately didn't now, but um, screen grabs from the game Animal Crossing, where you can catch the fish displayed here on this page. So kind of a fun example of um, one of the many, many uses for these resources. And that is my last slide. So thank you all for listening. And I hope I didn't speak too quickly, um, but welcome to the virtual Getty. Thank you, that was wonderful. Um, I haven't seen any questions come into the chat yet, but I was wondering what was the what is the foot traffic like? You know, obviously pre-COVID, you know, on a on an average day at the Getty. That's a great question. I don't have a number um, in front of me, but I would say because we have the exhibition space and that's located by the main entrance, we will get a lot of. Um, unintentional foot traffic, I'll say, sort of people wandering in just to, to see what's going on, um, which is really nice because a lot of people, you know, still just don't realize that there is a library that is open to the public and accessible. We have um, our first floor is available for walk-in browsing and using the computers and printing and things like that. So um, if you haven't been before, I will say that the Getty is a difficult place to access. It is literally on top of a hill past the 405, you take a little tram up the mountain to get there. And it's it's not it's really not easy to get to. So being accessible and actively accessible to all of our researchers and anyone who's interested in the collections is something we always struggle with. So um, I personally am really glad that we have that exhibition space located so close to the, the library. We get a lot of foot traffic that way. Um, and then I will say also that the the art research world is a small one. And my first um, month at the Getty, I had just moved from New York and someone came to the reference desk and did a double take and said, didn't I just ask you a question in New York? <laughs> what are you doing here? Was that not, do you have a, do you, are you related to someone? And I said, no, that's me. Um, and so that happened in person and by email, I was writing to a researcher that I had been corresponding with for questions at the Met. And then they wrote to the Getty and I wrote them and said, me again, um, getting back to you on this new request you have. And now I'm at the Getty. So that's why you're seeing my name again. So it is, you know, between the art researchers, our grad students in the area and, and walk-ins, it was, it's, it's busy. Nice. Uh, it looks like we just got another question that came in. So besides, didn't I just see you in New York? What are one or two of the more memorable reference questions you've gotten recently? Oh, gosh. Um, I mean, we really get such a wide range. I feel like we should keep a list of some of the kind of real doozies or the, the winners. Um, one, a, a few things in our collection, we have one of the first um, special collections um, was a little bit different and there were some art objects included in it that probably wouldn't be acquired the same way today. Um, so some of those materials, when people ask for, that was a big kind of double take that I did um, when figuring out how to provide them in the reference room and um, scheduling that space, knowing how much space they needed, how many seats, because there are, uh, it's, the Jean Brown collection, um, a Fluxus artist. And so there is a literally like a bottle with a dead mouse. There is, there, there's this whole range of wacky, you know, this one book that's supposed to look like cheese, but like isn't actually, but maybe is uh, all these conservation kind of nightmares, um, but fascinating objects. So those get requested a lot. And they're part of an exhibition that is opening very soon. So there's um, a catalog for that if you're interested. Um, I, I got one request one time, someone was studying Van Gogh's fingerprints. That was kind of a wacky one um, that we you know, weren't really able to help with very much because we don't have Van Gogh's fingerprints. But uh, looking at that from kind of a conservation perspective and how to access that for IDing, photo, um, IDing paintings. Um, being able to see an artist's fingerprints 
uh, and conserved in their medium. Okay, and we've got actually a couple of questions about digitization. Um, yes. So um, is there more work going into adding resources online? I know digitization has become more important due to COVID, but I'm wondering if the new normal will continue to push organizations to add resources to online spaces. And related, um, how big is your digitization department? Um, the answer is yes, definitely 100% and pretty large. So um, we benefit by working for an institution that was essentially founded by an oil magnate. So we are a rare um, nonprofit that, that has access to funding in a very, very different way from any other nonprofit that I've ever worked for. Um, so we have, uh, so, so we will absolutely be continuing the push regardless of remote access to digitize more of our collections and materials. Um, I think that the approach is one that I personally agree with in that it should never replace the object, but, but be in addition to. So we're, we're at the same time working to preserve and acquire physical collections while making them um, accessible in a digitized format. So that will absolutely continue. And um, we have several different digitization programs um, and the GRI alone. So we have a team that works directly with digitizing materials that are going to be available through the internet archive. We have a team um, on site in one of our eight vaults digitizing using book eye scanners um, and, and others working for uh, materials that will be uh, images that will be stored in our internal digital asset management system. So that's a whole separate kind of team. And then another imaging department that does all the high resolution imaging for publication requests. So, I mean, those are the ones that I know, that I know about. I'm sure there are other staff involved as, as well, um, but it is, it is very mind blowing to be in a library that has this kind of fleet of, of staff members working on this. Thank you so much. Wonderful. Well, if anybody has any additional questions for Annalise, we will have um, another chance to ask more questions. Annalise, thank you so much. That was an amazing presentation. And the next time I'm in your area, I'm definitely coming in for a tour. So Judy, I'm going to turn it back over to you to introduce us to our representatives from the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art Library. Thanks, Laura. So first up, or maybe not first up, I don't know what, or, what order they're going in, but we have Abby Bridge. Abby is a senior reader services librarian at the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art Library. She started working at um, SMOMA in 2003 as library cataloger and, had, and was later special cataloger before moving into her current role. She is also an adjunct librarian at City College of San Francisco and has previously worked as a librarian in the San Francisco Public Library, the North Baker Research Library of, of the California Historical Society and the Museum of Modern Art Library. As a freelance researcher and consultant, she has contributed to a wide range of historical and arts related projects. Abby holds an MLIS with a specialization in archives from the University of Texas at Austin and a BA in art history from Reed College. We also have David Senior. David is the head of library and archives at the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art. Senior lectures often on the history of artists publications and contemporary art and design publishing. Formerly, he was the senior bibli bibliographer at the Museum of Modern Art Library in New York City. At MoMA, he curated many, ex excuse me, it's late, exhibitions of, of artist books, magazines, and ephemera. For the last 12 years, he has organized a program of events, the Classroom for Printed Matters New York Art Book Fair, and more recently at the Los Angeles Art Book Fair. The Classroom has involved more than 400 talks, performances, and workshops by contemporary artists, designers, writers, and publishers. His writing has appeared in many books, art and design magazines and journals. He most recently edited Stephen Lieber at Catalogs, a book on the sales catalogs of the book dealer Stephen Lieber with Inventory Press and Right Editions. He serves on the board of directors of Primary Information and Yale Union. Welcome Abby and David. 
Hello, thank you for the introduction and uh, welcome to the SF MoMA Research Library. I've been fantasizing about visiting the Pacific Northwest for about a year and a half. So, so I'm happy to be with you virtually tonight. It's as close as I'm gonna get for a little while. So um, welcome. And uh, we're kind of doing this old school. I'm letting David drive the slide presentation. So, um, so slide please, David. <laughs> Unless you want me to do, okay, thank you. <laughs> All right, so SF MoMA is located in the South of Market neighborhood of San Francisco. It's one of the largest museums of modern and contemporary art in the United States. And the research library was one of the original departments in the museum when it was founded in 1935 in the Veterans Building. And in this picture, you can see the Boda Building, which was our 90s, the building um, the museum built when it moved to SOMA in the, in the mid 90s. And behind it is our um, addition, the Snohetta Building, which was the white building that really almost looks disconnected from it, but uh, is, is behind it is, is the new addition. So our, I think our gallery space increased four times with that addition um, in, in uh, I think 2016. Uh, so, so that's where we are. And uh, I'm gonna give you just an overview of the museum library. And then David will go into more detail on our collections and some of the, our library activities. So moving along, in the library, we preserve and provide access to a growing collection of research materials on modern and contemporary art, photography, architecture and design, and our collections include books, serials, exhibition documentation, ephemera, and some media collections. And our depart department supports the museum's mission, which is to assemble unparalleled collections, creating exhilarating exhibitions, and develop engaging public programs that connect with our community. Our library collections support all of the museum's activities and uh, departments across the museum. So who are we? We're a scrappy little group here. There's, uh, we're not the Getty, that's for sure. <laughs> There's four of us in our department uh, in of the library, which includes David, uh, head of library and archives, Myself, I'm part-time as a reader services librarian. Sandy Simano is our cataloger and Ella Milliken Detro is our collections coordinator and she splits her time between the library and the archives. Our department is library and archives. I'm not gonna talk about uh, the archives tonight, but I, I'll put some links in the chat. I encourage you all to explore some of um, our archives content online, um, but it's kind of too much to cover in this presentation now. So um, the archives collections start out as part of the library collections. They're the institutional records of the museum, but the archives was established as a department in 2006 with a Getty um, processing grant. And actually the first archivist, Dana Holtz is here tonight as part of our as part of our group. She lives in the Northwest now. So, and then we also have a records management program, which is part of our department uh, established in 2015. Our department is part of the collections division and other departments in that division are collections information and access. They handle right, rights and reproductions in our dams, collections management, conservation and registration. Uh, so again, our library has four staff members and then the archives has two full-time staff members, Peggy Tramway, our archives and records manager and Meg Ocampo, who's our associate records manager. So who uses the SF MoMA library? It's primarily a staff library. We would love to have the kind of open access um, that a lar larger museum libraries do, but we're, as you can see, a, a small group and you know, primarily focused on supporting the research needs of our staff. Uh, curatorial research is the main focus of uh, collections use in our museum, but also any, any department, uh, is welcome to use the the library and it's it's also used heavily by by education and community engagement uh, conservation has their own library but they also use ours departments really across the museum uh, make use of our collections and our collection development tries to support the entire museum uh, we're also open to external researchers uh, including academics uh, instructors but also students of all levels uh, gallerists, uh, art collectors, 
other museum professionals in the Bay Area use our collections heavily. And, and we do like the Getty Getty International visitors as well. Our collections are primarily used for research, but we also uh, lend for exhibitions. We create some of our own exhibitions and our as like the Getty, a lot, our collections are reproduced in publications fairly often. So, our light. Oh, sorry, David. Can you go back just one? I just want to point out the space. Um, so this this image is is a good uh, overview of our space. This is the library reading room with a class visit. I think that they're looking at artists periodicals. So periodicals created by artists, not about artists. And uh, that space opens onto our library lounge. And in the background, you can see our library stacks. The other library space that's not shown uh, to the right is just our staff offices. So it's, it's, a, it's a fairly small space. It's on the lower level in a non-public area of the museum. So. And during open hours, we uh, visitors come through uh, past our reference desk, which is also our circulation desk. All SFMOMA staff members are welcome to browse open stacks and check out books. Our lounge area is a casual space where people can look at magazines and books. A lot of our installation staff uh, are also working artists, so they enjoy, you know, appreciate looking at, at current art periodicals. Uh, staff can return checked out items and pick up holds in this area too. Non-circulating materials like artist books, ephemera files, special collections items are viewed in our reading rooms. External visitors request materials in advance through our catalog and those are paged by library staff and then they're viewed in the reading room. So, Our library collection is split between two locations. The main collection is in the library at the museum, but about half of our collection is stored offsite at our collection center uh, where our museum's art collection is stored and it's also where the archives and uh, and record center is. So uh, we have about 50% off site in South San Francisco. And if you're not familiar with the Bay Area, South San Francisco is actually a different city. So our off site storage is about 15 miles from the museum uh, near San Francisco International Airport. And the decision to split was based on frequency of use and also um, storage conditions. So the bulk of our collection is books. We have more than 80,000 books, including monographs, catalog raisonnés, exhibition catalogs, and more. We also have large ephemera collections on site at the museum. We have our artist book collection and special collections, as well as a uh, Skowhegan Lecture Archive and the Kurumbo Collection of Japanese photo books and uh, current, current issues of periodicals. But most of our periodicals are, are held at the collection center. So this is just Im the images are of our main stacks and then also some you may recognize the special collections housing all those all those boxes that that uh, people sort of fetishize as being part of special libraries right. Uh, and so at the collection Center, we do share our space with the archives, this is a uh, Meg and Peggy at work. Uh, we have compact shelving in both locations throughout and uh, again it's our lesser use collections there. Uh, our periodicals collection is enormous. We have 2,100 titles, 75,000 issues. I think it's probably grown quite a bit since we came up with those numbers. And another large collection at the Collection Center is our artist files. We have over 50,000 files for individual artists, uh, ephemera files, mostly exhibition announcements, but also surveys, bibliographies, press releases. And those are a really unique resource um, we have. Uh, we also, um, sorry, David, <laughs> thank you. Um, we also have the Sydney Tillam collection, which is a collection of 1100 books on the history of photomechanical processes. Photography is a huge strength of SF MoMA, and that's reflected in the library collections. Uh, and then we also have um, other formats of books and we have organization files as well, which uh, is ephemera collected again since the library's founding in 1935 for, for all of these collections. Okay, so collection building, where do they come from? So internal donations are the largest part of our, of our annual collecting. We get donations from mostly curatorial, the director's office, also from rights and reproductions, but, but from uh, 
departments across the museum. We also get external donations. These can be single items. We got a stack of museum publications from a former employee recently. Uh, we also get large gifts of, of special collections, uh, such as the current Bow collection of Japanese photo books. We do purchasing on a smaller level. David can talk more about that. Uh, relationships with dealers and uh, small art publishers are very important to our collection building. And then we receive some items on exchange. For many, many years, you know, international publications were very hard to come by. And like many museums around the country, we traded with museums around the world. And that's how we built a very international multilingual collection that is, is not really replicated in say university or other art collections in, in the area. Um, this is just a recent box. I was like the Japanese box, uh, boxes are always my favorite. They, they're so tidy. <laughs> and and uh, this, I think maybe from the Tokyo National Art Museum. So we still do get, get a lot of international publications just sent to us because museums and, and uh, galleries, arts organizations want their publications available. And, and there aren't really other libraries in the Bay Area who collect this material. So, um, so we're unique in that way. And oftentimes, you know, I do see our holdings, the closest um, will be, you know, in LA at LACMA or the Getty or else in New York at the larger art museums there. So a um, little bit about our collection and moving on. <laughs> um, so our online access is through our online catalog. We use a WMS, which is OCLC's library services platform. The discovery layer is based on worldcat.org, which probably all of you are familiar with. Our catalog includes our print holdings, but also links to ebooks and full text articles, which are becoming more and more important um, in these times. Uh, we have subscription databases to ProQuest, Starts Premium, and Artnet. And then we have, uh, we don't have a lot digitized at this point, but we have a small collection and growing collection of historical material available through the Internet Archive. That's material that was digitized through a program called California Revealed at the California State Library. And then we've uh, been adding more material to our internal uh, digital assets management system. We call it our digital garden. And uh, those initiatives are, are really important and uh, you know, will continue to, to grow um, regardless of how soon we can reopen our doors fully to outside researchers and, and you know, our, our staff. So. Uh, just a little note on user services. I was going to say, you know, sort of before and after, but really, you know, after a year and a half, we can't say there is a before and after. <laughs> I think our, you know, our services are really in our libraries really evolving in a permanent way right now. And, you know, some of it's hard and some of it's really exciting. I would say things that, you know, we probably should have been doing for, a, for you know, a few years and, and the need was there. So, Right now, our research support is, is primarily remote. Uh, a lot of email, phone, chat, video. You know, again, we're a small group and people know us, so people contact us individually or you know, email us at library at sfmoma.org. Uh, we can we're always available for you know appointments with staff. Uh, we have online drop-in hours too on Teams. We do a whole lot more scanning than we used to. We used to say, come on down and really encourage people to come to the library. But honestly, people were so busy already that once we reopened in the new space, we had a lot less foot traffic from visitors. And because we're in a non-public area, our we can only have so many external visitors. So really the need was already there and, and we're, we're meeting it with more scanning and trying to, to not have that be a one-off, but also feed that into these, into digital content building as well. So um, we have limited in-person hours for reference and stacks. Again, we each uh, work on site. Uh, there's three of us, David and Ella and I each take one day a week to have some open browsing hours for staff. We know browsing is really important and looking at special collections and artist books and other materials. Uh, you know, we hope to expand that, but we are moving to a hybrid workplace. So we know our users aren't all coming back full time and we're not coming back full time on site either. So again, it's, it's a brave new world we're in. 
Uh, and then unfortunately we've had to suspend external visitors since March, 2020. So, uh, you know, we're hoping we can reopen in January, but, but we don't know how that'll look. In the meantime, you know, we continue to increase our e-resources. We've added lots of open access content to our catalog, including content from the Getty. So that's exciting. And, um, and we've also started doing ILL both for our, um, for our, our internal users and to provide some access to our unique collections externally. So that's where we're at. We'll see what the next 86 years brings and on to David to talk a little more about the warp and weft of our collections and activities. Hi everybody. Um, Really excited to be here and thanks for, for following along and thanks Abby and, and thanks Annalise for your, your presentations. Um, I'm calling from a shed in Berkeley, California, so I'm happy to, to be here through the, through the screen. Um, I've worked at the museum, uh, it's been four years now, um, as the head of the library and archives. Um, one of the things that I am so... Um, so intrinsic to the work that we do is uh, working with local students, particularly higher ed groups. So this is a, a, a sampling of just like what it looks like when students come to our spaces. And it's a nostalgic view now because they haven't been there. Um, I've been doing a lot of this, the Zoom presentations to students um, in higher ed programs throughout the country. So one of the lemonade in the lemons thing about the Zoom presentations as I can open up these presentations to sort of broader geographical areas, which is cool. Um, a quick uh, aside is like a, a big part of our department's work is to capture the history of the museum itself. And we have archivists on staff that do that. So um, an aspect of our department that I work with and with our team is our archives. Um, this is Grace McCann Morley who was the founding um, curator director of the museum, um, who is a, still heavily researched and an active presence in how we conceive of our history and our, um, our place in the history of modern art. Um, so uh, this is our mission statement that you can read while I'm talking. <laughs> um, it's just some more views of our archivists and records management. Um, program that happens at our collection center. Um, so this is ongoing engagement with our staff, with our history. That's part of our, our, our mission as well. Um, there's some really amazing things that connect to the history of modern art, but also the history of museums and exhibition making in the United States um, that are based in our library and, and our archives. Um, this is a really neat and um, highly racist a uh, map, a uh, chart of an early um, cubism and ab abstract art show that was circulated from the Museum of Modern Art um, uh, in the 1936 and arrived in San Francisco um, at the same year. And this is another uh, sample of some sort of special items from our history that a uh, museum hosted a soapbox derby in 1976 and 70 starting in 75 but through 76 77 78 annually and this is a poster for that soapbox derby where artists would create um soapbox vehicles in an artistic manner and barrel down a hill in mclaren park in san francisco um for this presentation i'm just going to quickly hit on some formats and genres that make us unique and in this kind of context for special libraries. I'm just trying to summarize what makes us special. Our artist files make us special. Um, we have, as Abby mentioned, around 50,000 and they're really the work of librarians and volunteers for the past 80 years. Um, and the sampling of what you might find in them, it's sort of the granular bits of art history where researchers can find the dates and the times of exhibition um, of the career of an individual artist, but also um, gallery spaces and other organizations that made exhibitions um, in the Bay Area, but all over the world as well. Um, it's an international collection that um, 
it has been unprocessed. We've had uh, electrievers from the uh, early 80s that manage all of these files and they were a browsable collection in our former iteration. And now they're in the collection center and they're less browsable. So there were um, fast paced processing project for us, which it'll be years before we finish. Um, but we're, we're trying to make these uh, available and not a hidden collection by creating bibliographic records for them. And in some cases, creating um, creating digital records for them and digital assets for them. Um, this is just a sample of some of the boxes that we've um, started to process. You can see they're early in the alphabet. Um, this is another aspect of this project where we've highlighted um, certain artists that we want to scan their artist files. So this 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 set of folders translates to this in our uh, dam, and this is something that we want to be able to use as a reference resource to external researchers, especially or perhaps populate something like the Internet Archive. Right now, it's, it'll be an internet resource, our internal resource uh, for our staff and, and our external researchers. Um, this is just a quick image of a few highlights from some of the things we already scanned, which are three really beautiful invitations from the early career of the artist Ruth Asawa. Um, one of the things that also makes us unique is this subject file collection that were, were um, started in the 60s by an affiliate group um, called the Women's Board at the museum. And they were um, trying to collect as, as much as possible and as best as possible exhibition making by organizations and galleries in the Bay Area. Uh, Northern California. Um, and so we've continued this project and started to process these materials. Um, in this case, I think there's around 6,000 files for in this in this ephemera collection. Um, here's an example of an early one from 1953 um, from the artist Jess and the, uh, a portrait of the artist Jess and the poet Robert Duncan. Um, this is another image from our Northern California Gallery files from an organization called Galleria de la Raza in the Mission, um, and they were founded in the late 60s and were involved with um, the Chicano arts movement in the city and also the, the murals, uh, the sort of Chicano muralism that was really present in the Mission. So this was a community, a flyer for a community um, mural project that happened in 1974. Um, one of the new, unique parts about the gallery files is, especially at its inception, that they ask the galleries to submit their histories or their mission. And so each of the files from this time period can contain often a letter or a typescript that gives the mission of the museum. And this was something that um, this example is from a short-lived uh, African-American uh, founded and run gallery called the Black Man's Art Gallery that flourished or existed in, from 1967 to 1974. And again, here's our, our prior, uh, before shot of this, this collection before they received some of those nice um, file boxes that you saw in the prior one. And then I'll just give a little vignette of like how our curators use this collection. We have a a very amazing project happening now at the museum called the that was Diego Rivera's Pan American Unity mural, and in this case, uh, the mural was produced in San Francisco in 1940. It had been living at City College in the city um, prior to this year, but we have this very large Rivera mural on loan um, right now at the museum. Um, so these are for our curators. These are things that they were working on throughout this project and, and some examples of an early history of the library where you have a book plate by an early like founding trustee, Albert Bender. Um, this is a book plate from our founding uh, curator, uh, Grace McCann Morley from a trip she took to Mexico City, sort of documenting early engagement with the, um, with the art of Mexico, particularly muralism at the time. And um, these are sort of contemporary magazines from the 20s that featured Rivera or um, muralism as a theme that um, we either acquired or had already in the collection for this project. 
Um, these are items from Rivera's artist file. Um, so these are things that we digitized and um, researchers and particularly our curators can access for their research. Um, and you can see these sort of news clippings that were from uh, the sort of cutting services um, as well as correspondence from uh, uh, from donations or local um, collectors that donated this stuff to our our museum. And then um, related to the actual setting of the mural, we have the San Francisco Art Association Bulletin, where um, we recently digitized um, through the California Reveal grant that Abby mentioned, and Abby initiated this, this grant project. So all of the issues around this time could be referenced and available to um, external researchers, researchers, but um, in this digital format through the internet archive. Um, and the mural was uh, created by also a lot of local artists. So um, this is an example of uh, things from the artist file of those local artists. So you have um, a, a questionnaire from the past when artists participated in art association um, exhibitions at the museum, or um, Emmy Lou Packard was an assistant in the mural and this hurt a flyer for her studio sale. Um, and also uh, on the right, a, um, a mimeogra mimeograph, uh, newsletter from uh, Topaz of um, a local artist, Mino Akubo. Uh, Mino Akubo was um, prior to the Second World War, uh, a very active artist in the San Francisco art scene. Um, she was interned in the 40s, and this is um, something in her artist file that was a newsletter from the Topaz camp. So these are a very wide range of materials um, that we, we could provide to support um, research uh, for this specific project. So I thought that would be like an interesting sort of case example for, um, for that. Um, speaking of Akubo, this is just the lastly, I'll just end with this. This is something from our archives, which um, she was friends with Grace McCann Morley and was sending letters to her. And this is illustrations from the internment camp uh, that came with like a Christmas greeting from 1943 to our, um, to Morley. Uh, this is in our, in Morley's files in our archives. Um, and just one lastly to highlight this call and response activity between like special things in our archives and then in our library. This is a subsequent book that Akubo, you know, Akubo made from these these drawings, which became a very uh, historic document of the life and at the Topaz um, internment camp. So these are this book would be in our special collections um, and uh, are really poignant uh, local history for us in terms of some of the staging areas in Tanafran, which is near where our collection center is, um, and then um, uh, things from the the camp. I'm going to stop there because I think we're we're at time. So um, thank you so much, and I'm happy. We're happy to answer questions. Thank you. Um, so one of the the questions that came in during um, your talk was, how did you choose which artist files to prioritize? I'm not uh, sure like, in the in digitization or just in collection in general, but maybe you could answer. Both. Uh, <laughs> During the last year and a half, we've had a lot of discussions about um, DEI in our collections. How do we think about diversifying and 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 um, expanding uh, the canon with areas that we're we're interested in doing better at in terms of deep collecting? Um, so the main the 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 um, for the digitized artist files. It was, we prioritized artists of color and particularly local uh, artists of color from the Bay Area and or artists that have a strong presence in our collections that were artists of color and are, are part of um, upcoming research um, uh, and particularly women um, as well uh, in terms of um, trying, to, uh, trying to expand our, uh, 
some of the in terms of local uh, Bay Area artists, um, the availability of unique research materials that we had in in those files. Thank you. Um, do you work with other art libraries, other institutions, public libraries? Do you sort of have have um, projects and in, in collaborations? Mm -hmm. I think, um, uh, as Abby mentioned, like within the holdings that we have, that we have a lot of shared um, collection interests with Lacma and the Getty, but also MoMA in New York and um, other sort of um, art institute in Chicago, the Walker Art Center, um, museums that have uh, museum libraries, um, and also are uh, working with modern and contemporary materials. So those are, and yeah, even like the Metropolitan Museum, Watson Library has a very large uh, collecting interest for modern and contemporary. So within that community, um, professionally, a lot of our staff are active in Arliss. Um, so that's another um, professional. And and Abby can speak to especially the, the Bay Area um, community. It's a small community, but but everybody knows each other. So there's always opportunities to collaborate. Yeah, our, our list is the Art Librarians Association of uh, or Society of North America. And uh, there's a local chapter in the Bay Area as well. But it's it's a small community of libraries in the Bay Area and, and particularly art libraries. And we certainly work collaboratively. Um, the the uh, San Francisco Art Institute is our sister organization. We both descended from the San Francisco Art Association. So their collections are really related to ours. And we collaborated on digitizing those San Francisco Art Association bulletins with them. We constantly refer um, both our staff, their students back and forth because our, our collections are so complimentary. Uh, we also, with City College, um, I, it's kind of funny, I was like representing both institutions, but with this exhibition, um, thinking on the City College side, I worked, uh, you know, participate in meetings on how the museum and City College could work together and what kinds of uh, programs we could come up with to support each other. Uh, one thing that came out of that is a curriculum group. And so a group of instructors from City College created curriculum around the mural to share publicly these are instructors who who teach around the mural at City College, but creating curricula for SF MoMA. And so from the SF MoMA side, then I was able to share our collections with that group and help them in their curriculum development. So so that's a very specific example. But we certainly work collaboratively with um, Bay Area, um, also historical uh, collections. You know, there's a lot of overlap in photography collections between historical collections and the museum collections. So there, there's there's it's a it's a small world. And um, yeah, we. Uh, we all kind of know each other here, so. Yeah, and we, we loan things to exhibition to other venues um, locally and nationally and internationally. So that's another point of collaboration. And I, I think both Getty and, and FSF MoMA, you both mentioned um, working with the Internet Archives. Mm -hmm. Is that, do, you, do you know the origins of that, that partnership, how that came around? I think for for Abby's project with California Revealed, there was um, there was um, a established understanding that the digitized materials from that project would be, then be supported within the Internet Archive. Yeah, they California Revealed is a program that that it started with public libraries, but to facilitate digitization for small organizations that don't have, you know, the Getty's digitization resources or departments, even though, you know, in some ways we have a huge amount of resources in the museum, you know, we have wonderful vitrines that a library of our size could never afford, you know, that sort of thing. We don't have that, you know, capacity for digitization. So, so, and they encourage collaboration. So we've just been doing sort of bits each year, adding, adding, and, you know, hopefully we can, do larger grants. I know the art, uh, the art Institute's doing a huge digitization project through IMLS, so we'll get there someday, but it's really a great program to just get get um, libraries started with their, you know, with their unique collections. So that's, that's mm -hmm. how about. And they, they distribute, they have their own website, but it also goes to the Internet Archive and also Digital Public Library of America. So. Yeah, and the Internet Archive has been active in a 
melon originally a melon funded project but now a neh project that i've been participating in with a group of other art libraries around the country it started in new york but it's um the focus is on archiving websites um, related to our subject scope um, so using the archivit tool created at the internet archive um, to try to preserve um, websites that are relevant to um, the research that we're doing at our individual institutions. So that's another um, collaborative point for, with them. Okay, so thank you very much. Does anybody else have any questions for David or Abby or Annalise? We have an Instagram if you're oh. interested, especially if you have an institutional account. We love following institutional accounts, but um, that's another way to just have a, a a uh, look at the things that we're doing, especially the things that we're acquiring, um, new things that are, are we're focusing on for collection development. Wonderful, thank you. Mm -hmm. The Washington State Library just started following me. <laughs> the Getty has just one Instagram for the entire institution, so we don't have our own for the library, but I will post here the library blog it's all the blog, but um, we will post like our reopening updates and hopefully some more kind of exciting content in the future soon. Fantastic. Well, thank you all. I have just been thoroughly enjoying your amazing presentations and I cannot wait to visit your libraries when it is safe to do so. And I know we are, um, we're all feeling the same way. So at this time, um, we it is time to do the, unless anybody has any final questions for our presenters, um, I want to give them and all of us a time to socialize. So Laura G, I'm going to turn it over to you um, to talk to us about the breakout rooms. And um, again, I want to extend just such a huge thank you to David and Abby and Annalise for taking the time to talk to us tonight. And um, we really appreciate it. So thank you very much. Laura G, take it away. Thank you so much, Laura E. So I am going to reclaim the host role and I am going to assign everyone into a breakout room. So the way the breakout rooms are going to work is I'm going to try to have four people per breakout room, and then I'm going to open all the rooms at the same time. So I'm going to start assigning people to breakout rooms now. It's gonna take me just a moment to do this, but let's see, do we have everyone here? I think so. We just have 14 participants left. So let's put Ian there. There we go. Okay. And I and so I was just since we're recording again, I'll say thank you again to the SLACNW team, Eva and Laura D, and also to the SLAS, uh, pardon me, WLA uh, SLD team, Laura E and Sarah and Judy. And I particularly appreciate our presenters this evening, Annalise and Abby and David. We, we so appreciate your being here and telling us about your libraries. And for everyone who attended, everyone who's still here and everyone who was here before, thank you for attending our evening presentation. Please watch for announcements of future library crawls or other events. We hope to see you again. Thank you for joining us for this evening and enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Nice to meet everyone. Thanks, Sarah P for the links. Thank you. <laughs> Wonderful presentations, really thank loved you. it. Thanks again. Great. Thank Bye, you. Bye everybody. Bye-bye.
Laura G and Laura D, I will catch up with you um, I, in email tomorrow. Yes, indeed. Thank All right. you so much for again. Thank you. This stellar, is a great event. Job, Thanks, stellar job leading this All evening. All right. Thanks. Thank Likewise. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye-bye. Okay,